Sometimes you gotta start out when you're talking about something like this by sharing a little bit about your own so everybody can relate, say, okay, because I'm not perfect. Okay, I asked my, my oldest, my teenage son, I said, hey, are there some bad habits that, that dad has? And I, and I was hoping for, you know, a, a gentle response. <laughs> I didn't think it through. I forgot. You don't ask teenagers their opinion if you're not ready to take it. I wasn't ready for it. And he said, yep, dad, I, well, you're a bit of perfectionist. And sometimes you expect too much. I was like, ouch. Well, can't argue with you. So I had to work through that. I had to pick myself up off the carpet and take a walk around the house and then get back to working on my message because I was like, that's just a little too close to home. I don't want to talk about that. Um, if you were to ask my wife some habits I have, well, she would, one of the ones that she'd make mention of, and she makes mention of quite often, I, I, I sometimes use the word we when I should use the word me or you. Like, it's frowned upon when I say we should change the diaper. It's like, no, you should change the diaper. And there's no we, it's more of a you, yep. me situation. Here's the, here's the products, go ahead and take care of that. Okay, you handle that. So I'm working on some of those habits. Um, I'm working on this apologizing. I, I say that a lot. Pastor James has been um, graciously and gently uh, rebuking me every time I apologize. I say, don't, don't say sorry. He said, say sorry when you need to. I was like, ooh, okay, well, that's scary. I'm gonna need to say I'm sorry for something at some point. But yes, yeah, so I'm working on some of these. We all got some of those things that, those habits that we're trying to change or stop. Some of those addictions, those routines. And, and today, I want us to, to focus on ours, our habits, not somebody else's. So I want to give us some rules as we get started today, something that's going to help us leave here today with the person or persons that we came with. Okay, I want you to leave here today walking out together, not people leaving at separate times or, or calling an Uber to get you out of here. Okay, so here's some of the rules. We change ourselves first. We change ourselves first. So no poking, no pointing, no elbowing the person beside you. Okay, no, no, <clears throat> no, none of that. None of the side eye stuff that we do when we are trying to get somebody's attention. No, no texting somebody and saying, I wish, sure wish you were here today. Wink, wink. I'll send you the message when it's posted. Nobody leaning over and saying, are you listening to this? This is why I brought you today. No, no. No, for the next few moments, we're, we're going to listen and ask God to help us to apply what we learned today to ourselves and not worry about anyone else. Because how many know this? If God can change me, God will change everything around me. Yes. But at first, some of us, I know, I know. See, I want him to fix them, this. Well, let him fix you first. Here's our key passage as we get started in Romans chapter 12. Let's read it together. Can we? Ready, set, go. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing him. And let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. God wants to transform your life and give you the help you need to stop some bad habits some bad compulsions, a challenging lifestyle. Before we dive too deep into this, I, I wanna ask this question, why is it so hard to change them, to change these things? Because some of us have tried and we failed, we've failed, we've attempted and we've, we, we've come up short. Sometimes it's because we've had them, these habits or these, these habits it's challenges, we've had them so long. It's like Pastor said in week one, it's, it's, like a, it's like having that certain credit card that some of you have grown so attached to, it's like one of your pets. You put it in a special spot in your wallet because when you want something, I'm gonna reach for that. Even if I don't have it, I'm gonna pay for it. Figure it out. Some of us need to put that card in the shredder, but you know what I'm saying, that's neither here nor there. No judgment, no judgment at all. 
But it's become something that we've become so attached to, so familiar with. Sometimes it's hard to change because, because there's a payoff. As unhealthy as it may be, there's a payoff that comes into our life. And as we heard last week, there's this, this habit loop where, where the trigger produces a reaction and then the reward comes. And some of us, as much as we do not like the person that we become, there's a payoff. There's something that we reap, something that we get that consistently keeps us attached or we can't let go. Some of us, I can say this, it's, it, we, we find ourselves not being able to change because, can I be honest, the devil doesn't want you to change. See, God wants you to walk in freedom. God, God came that you might have life and that more, more abundant, but can I tell you this? The enemy comes as a roaring lion. He ain't no lion, but he comes as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. He's trying to take away the very things that Jesus bought and paid for. For some, we identify with the habit. We've become so enmeshed with it that the habit is us and we are the habit. We, we, we can't distinguish between the two. Our identity is found in, in, in I'm, I'm, I'm an overspender or, or, or I'm lazy. I like to kick back, relax, you know. Okay, cool. I'm overweight. Well, let's not talk about that. I'm an alcoholic. We identify ourselves and that becomes of who I am. We take on the identity of the very thing that we are also frustrated about. It becomes our, our excuse in some respects. Can I tell you this? You see, most of our labels get developed before we're six years of age. And then they get solidified by 12 years of age. By the time we're adults, we have identified with these labels so strongly, they cloud our ability to see ourselves, but most importantly, they cloud our ability to see how God sees us. We can't see past our own view. And out of these identity and labels, we develop habits, both good and bad. Many of the habits and patterns you've developed in childhood, they, they may not be comfortable, they may be self-defeating, but they're familiar and their familiarity keeps us attached and makes them continue to be a part of our lives. We've, we've resorted to saying, well, that's just the way I am. Really? That's just the way I am. Angry? That's just the way I am. As my daughter and son would say to each other, annoying? Some of us have become to say, that's just the way I am. It becomes our thing of saying, I give given up. It's the way I am because I don't know what to do outside of this particular thing. We get hurt and we make vows to begin to live out of our labels instead of our God-given identities. So to change our bad habits, we have to change our identity. And to change our identity, we have to change our mind. So, so how do I cooperate with God's change process? How do I get myself involved with that? Romans 12, 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, your thoughts are your autopilot in life. And if you want to change your life, then you have to change the way you think. I know, follow me for just a second. I'm laying a foundation because I want you to begin to understand the process by which we change. But some of us, we don't know the, the why behind the what. We're just trying to do the what. And the reason we find ourselves always coming up short is because we haven't identified the why. That's where the power lies. See, the Bible teaches your thoughts determine your feelings and your feelings determine your actions. Some of you may be trying to make changes through sheer willpower. And might be missing the thing that is leading you right back to those old habits. You keep your, find yourself revolving around the same thing. Because you're focusing on one thing and losing it on the other. It's like the workman who was leaving the factory one day. And he was, as he's walking out, he was pushing a wheelbarrow. And inside the wheelbarrow is a, was a small box. 
So he's making his way out of the factory and he stopped by the security shack as everybody had to file out past the security to make sure everybody was good. So he's filing past that and security guard stops and says, hey, hey, what's with the box? He says, well, listen, sir. He said, listen, at the end of every shift that they take all the, the sawdust and they just sweep it and throw it out. So I, 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 I need some in my house. I want some for something. So I t- collected the sawdust and I, I put it in this box. I'm just going to take it home. He said, we'll, we'll open the box. So open the box and sure enough, there's sawdust in there. So the man said, okay, you can go ahead. It's happened. Second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, he runs past the same security guard pushing the wheelbarrow, the box in there. The security guard stops and says, what's going on? He says, well, you asked me that the other day. It's, it's just sawdust. He said, open the box. Sure enough, sawdust still there. Security guard says, I just got this gut feeling. You know, something ain't right here, man. Okay, uh, listen, just be honest with me. What's going on? If you tell me, I promise you, I ain't gonna do anything about it, but just tell me what, what's going on. What are you, what are you doing? What, what, what's your deal here? And the man said, well, I'm stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> Some of us can be so preoccupied with the small things, we miss the big picture. Some of us have some things that are just walking right past us, slipping through our fingers. We're trying to make changes, but we're missing the main thing because we're distracted by things that don't really matter to begin with. We think we're doing what's right, and it may work for a while, but then sooner than we think, we're, we're tired, we're, we're under tension, and we're losing the things that things just kind of go by and by, and we're like, man, I can't ever seem to get it right. If you want to change, you've got to change your perspective. And I want to give you seven things, seven ways you can change the way you think and cooperate with God so you can begin to live out the change that he bled and died for. The first thing I want to look at is this. Focus on changing one defect at a time. One thing at a time. I know some of you can begin to make a list, but one thing at a time. Proverbs, the wise man said this, an intelligent person aims at wise action, but a fool starts off in many directions. Now, some of you, that's how your morning started right now. You started out like, I need coffee, but I'm hungry. But I also got to get dressed. I don't know what to wear. And we're like, we're going to mile nothing. No shame in it. I get you. But we started out our day just, just all scattered. We sometimes start out our days scattered. Some of you have been with us since the beginning of this series, and, and, and this is great. You've got like 30 things that you've been wanting to change, or 30 things you need them to change. Again, don't, don't do that. But see, if you begin to think like that, you're going to find yourself discouraged, overwhelmed, defeated, and you won't change a thing. As we've heard various times in this series, if you start with one thing, it's going to have a domino effect in the other areas and the other habits of your life. But you got to start with one thing. Because the one thing will begin to have an impact and an effect on the other things. If God changes you, everything around you will begin to change. But so many times we're distracted by everything around us then we forget about the one thing God is speaking through his spirit for us to change today. Be specific with God. Don't just say, oh God, I just want to be a good person. Well, duh. That's why we're here, right? I want to be better. I want to be good too. And I'm, I'm, don't, don't take that personal. But can I tell you this? Be specific with God. God already knows. I hate to burst your bubble. You, you're great at hiding it. Probably a lot of people don't know. Your boss don't know. Your spouse don't know. <laughs> God does. Like he's like, I see you. Like right there. Bam. So talk to him. Tell him. By God's grace, I'm going to stop my, my challenges with, with anxiety. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let go of my out-of-control anger. I'm, I'm going to try to stop being so controlling of others or, or over-drinking, over-spending, over-eating. Or, or I'm going to let go of this porn habit, this lust habit, and 
Give it to God and be specific, but let it focus one thing at a time. Ask God this, which one of these things is most destructive in my life? And start there. Can I tell you this? The Holy Spirit will reveal the thing that you need to work on if you ask God to, to reveal it to you. I used to work in a, used to run, excuse me, a rehabilitation center. And people would come in with so many things, challenges and vices. And they'd want to make, just, just make sweeping changes. And we would tell them, listen, don't focus on this. Focus on one thing. And it feels so wrong to say, you know, don't let go of some certain things. It's like, that's not good for them. No, no, no. Look, can I tell you this? Let's just start with one thing. We've made this so hard for ourselves. But if we can do it when it comes to certain things, like why can't we do it in our relationship with God? Just start with one thing. Let the Holy Spirit reveal, because if the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, the Holy Spirit will empower you to work through that thing. And if you work through that thing, the Holy Spirit's going to help you work through the next thing. And the next thing. And the next thing. So focus on changing one defect at a time. Number two, focus on victory one day at a time. One day at a time. Matthew 6 says this, give us this day our annual bread. No. Give us this day our monthly bread. No. Give us this day our daily bread our daily bread why is it daily because we need to be fed by God every day then why are we not taking of what God has made available to us but a month at a time some of us are wanting to make that change but we're only wanting to make that change on Sundays and wondering why we wind up dry and empty and struggling by maybe Wednesday I'll give you Wednesday. Sometimes if I don't take what I need, it's Monday. <laughs> I'm done. Okay, I'm not perfect. I'll pray. Pray for me. See, God wants you to give to this, this gives you the strength for just that one day. Lamentation says this: great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin fresh each morning. You need something from God each and every day to take on the challenges of that particular day. See, so Lord, today I just want to be, I want to be patient. I, I want to think pure thoughts. I, I want to control my anger, be positive instead of negative, or, or, or be a person of integrity. Then, then stop making these rash vows. Can I be honest with you? Don't make rash vows of, God, I promise I'll never do it again. You need to stop that. Because you find yourself defeated. You find yourself just beating yourself up. And then the enemy preys on you through condemnation. You promised God, look at you now. You just yelled at your kid. Well, they deserved it. <laughs> and begins to prey on our emotions. Victory one day at a time. One day at a time. Some of you have been with us since the beginning of this series, and you think, I, 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 I want to get this right, and I'm struggling, and I'm doomed to fail. No, no, take it one day at a time. One day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. Matthew goes on to say, don't worry, Matthew 6 and 3, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Can I tell you this? Maturity takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. We live in a day where we want everything instantly. Instantly. Instant, instant potatoes. All right. I get you. It's Thanksgiving. Turkey takes time. We want instant everything. We want instant coffee. That's nasty. I'm sorry for some of you. That's just gross. You can't put enough creamer in there. Now, I'll give you this. Some Keurigs taste like instant coffee. We're praying about that. We want instant uh, popcorn. We want instant maturity. We want instant weight loss. Take this peel. Don't change anything. and Just watch it magically disappear. Come on, somebody. Some of you all got your pills, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> One day I'm a total mess, and next day I just want to be Mother Teresa. Come on. <laughs> you got to understand, you'll be working these principles out for the rest of your life. This is a scriptural word, and a big word, and you may not understand it, but this is called the process of sanctification. It's a journey that you'll work beyond it and, and be working on for the rest of your life. And God is okay with it. 
You're not expected to get it right day one. Because you'll be working. It's not an instant fix. And so we're expecting victory across everything. And God's just saying, listen, I'm going to work on you one day at a time. We're going to have victory each and every day because I promise you, I've already spoken victory over every situation. But let's get victory through the day, and then we'll work on victory for tomorrow. But let's just have victory today so we can see victory tomorrow. Amen? Amen. So victory, focus on that one day at a time. Number three, focus on God's power, not willpower. See, you already know that willpower is not enough. If it were, you have already changed whatever you're dealing with a long time ago. Many times your strength blocks your recovery, your transformation. Can I tell you this? I would rather move an entire house by myself, and I've done it, than to ask anyone for help. I remember there was one time my wife and I, we were moving from, from one space to the other, and this was before we had kids. And I remember we put a mattress on top of her Pontiac vibe. And I said, baby, it's late at night. You hold one side, I'll hold the other. And let's just try to get it there. The dumbest idea I ever had. <laughs> and if you know my wife, she started laughing because it, there was no way to make this right. And when she laughs, she can't hold anything anyway. She drops everything when she starts laughing. And it was the worst thing. I had to pull over and say, okay, this was a bad idea. I admit it. <laughs> See, we don't want to admit we need God, much less anyone else. I have to admit that I'm just an ordinary, everyday person who's in desperate need of God's help or the help of some people in my life. Willpower won't cut it, but God's power will. Jeremiah 13, 23, can a leopard take away his spots? No. Nor can you who are so used to doing evil now start being good. But I can't, I can't change by my own power, in my own power. We got to trust that it'll help us overcome it. We got to give God our stuff, our anger, our pride, our need to control, fear of rejection. Trust God to do it by his power, not your willpower. Not your willpower. This leads us to number four. Number four, focus on what I want, not what I don't want. Philippians 4 and 8 says this, fix your thoughts on what is true and good and right. Think about things that are pure. Think about all that you could praise God for and be glad about. He didn't say, think about this one. Think about that one. Focus on this thing. Focus on that thing. And then let the stress and the weight and the pressure and the bills put you in the ground. No. Think about what's good and lovely. He's saying, focus on the good things, not the bad things. Why? Because whatever you focus on is what you move towards. It's what, it's what dominates your life. If you focus on the bad, it's going to control your life. But if you focus on what you can be and what God wants you to be, then that will dominate your life. It's transforming our mind, not focusing on the sin which so easily besets us, but it's putting our eyes on Christ, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. Whatever has your attention has you. See, instead of focusing on what you don't want, instead of resisting, you refocus. Change the mental channel of your mind. One of the most helpful spiritual growths, and we've been saying this, and I promise you, we're just not trying, we, we just don't have like a profit on this. Like we don't get Bible sales. But scripture memorization is one of the greatest things that you can ever do in your life. We don't get 10 cents for every verse that's read here. Some of you think that, well, they just keep talking about this. We're talking about it because it will literally change your life. It will change your life. When you hide his words in your heart so that you, and it will allow you to not sin. It will lead you into the path of righteousness for his namesake. There are things with it. If you begin to memorize a verse a week, in 52 weeks, you're going to have 52 verses memorized, which means your focus can be on 52 different things, which will lead you into life everlasting, into 52 weeks where you're spent worrying about the things that you can't fix to begin with. I feel like we're always beating this drum, but I promise you, you get the word inside of you, 
You get life. This word is life. You get life inside of you. The things that are dead will begin to come to life through the power of Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozar said this, the Bible is not only a book which was once spoken, but it's a book which is now speaking. It's alive. And it's ready to go to work on your behalf if you apply it. When the scriptures are in your mind, the Holy Spirit will help you and use them to counteract the negative thoughts that the devil and other people give you. The only way to get over that negative response is to get in to God's response, is to thank God's word over everything over and over and over and begin to allow that. In therapy, I call that a distract skill. It's change your mind, focus on something else. And I promise you, it's not just a thing to just be a distraction, but when you begin to focus on something that actually matters and it's life-giving and life-transforming, it won't be just a distraction. It will be something that's transformational. It'll get you out of your mind, but it'll also get your mind on Christ. Number five, focus on doing good, not feeling good. Galatians 5, 16, if you are guided by the Spirit, you'll be in no danger of yielding to self-indulgence. It is saying if you do the right thing, your feelings will eventually catch up with you. You say, well, man, well, then I'm going to wait until I change. I'm going to wait until I feel like changing. That's when I'll change. Well, good luck with that. I have never felt like making a change in my life. I had those good ideas late at night. I say, maybe it's be a good time. Maybe I need to set my alarm, go to the gym. Then the alarm goes off. This was a bad idea. I want to lay here and go back to sleep. (laughs) It's always easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. If you rely on your feelings, they're going to lead you wrong. Make a choice and stick to it because it's the right thing to do. It's the very same thing with our spiritual growth habits. Things like praying, confessing, reading your Bible, developing a quiet meditation time. See, when you first start it, it may feel a little awkward, like starting a new habit, starting a new routine. It feels uncomfortable. Felt uncomfortable to get up for 21 days of prayer. My body said, this is not the time you should be waking up. This is not a great idea. I said, no, we're going to power through, believe in prayer. We wake up, right? The more you do it, the more you come... Well, I, I can't say that. I still struggle getting up in the morning. It's, that wasn't no big deal on that. But, the more, but I love the prayer time. I love the time every day being spent with Jesus as we start our day. That was the beauty. See, the, as you begin to start these spiritual habits, they may feel a little awkward, but the more you begin to press in, the more you're going to start feeling like, this feels good. This feels good to my soul. The sixth thing, focus on people who help me, not hinder me. The right kind of people will help you. The wrong kind of people will hinder or even prevent your recovery. Sometimes we're on the front end of dealing with our stuff. It's it's not the bad people as much as it's our, we've, we've, we've been misaligned. We've not connected ourselves with the people that can help lead us to where we need to go. If you're trying to eat healthy, don't hang out with your dessert friend. Okay? They're not the best influence for you. Not great at all. If you're trying to have a, 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 a good marriage and stay faithful in your marriage, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be really plain and pastoral. Don't be just hanging out with all the single buddies, the divorce buddies. Not saying we don't hang out with people. Follow me on this. You got to start doing life with your spouse. If you're wanting to have consistency and health in your relationship, your relationships will either make or break you. The Bible says this, two are better than one. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. If one person falls, the other person will help them up. You've heard from the very beginning of this series that recovery cannot happen by yourself. You must be in a group or in a covenant relationship. You need Jesus. Jesus designed us for a relationship. We're better together. Just listening to eight messages on recovery isn't going to make it happen unless you get with other people and work the process. We need people. We need the right people in our life. And I've invited my friend Joel to come up here and to share. Yes, yeah, give us some love. His story of when he connected his faith with the right people. Love you, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What's up, everybody? I'm Joel. Uh, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of what our God did for me well, and he can do for you, but we have to allow him to do it for us, you know? But... um. 
Here's a little about my, my backstory. I grew up in an old school Mexican family with a lot of drinking and partying. My father was a very angry drunk. There would be times where he would physically abuse my mom right in front of me and there's nothing I can do to protect her. If I cry, I just wanna let you know it's not out of sadness, it's out of happy tears because my God is an amazing God, you know what I mean? My, my mom eventually filed for divorce and moved us with my grandma. Unfortunately, she also had a husband who loved his drinking and his drugs. One night I wake up to screaming and as I got up, I see him running towards me, drops the knife at my foot. I just remember seeing blood everywhere. But thank God we all survived that night. A few, a few years later, my mom meets my stepdad. Everything seems to be going good. My dad also works on his sobriety picks me up every two weeks where I would attend AA classes with him on my Saturdays with him. However, living in a split family left me with a lot of freedom and led me to many wrong paths. I didn't have a feeling of a family because unfortunately, my parents were still trying to figure things out on their own lives. This led me to search for that feeling of acceptance and a sense of family in a lot of wrong places. I began hanging around with the wrong crowd drinking, fighting, doing drugs at a very young age. Later on in my teenage years, I get shot and I realize I need to change and live a better life. I move out of state with my aunt for a change and it actually made me worse. The drug use and drinking became heavier because I was still trying to take away the pain. I wanted to feel loved and, I, and accepted. I realized being out, out there I realized being out there still wasn't going to work out, so I moved back to LA. I get a job that keeps me busy, and with that, I knew I had to quit the drugs. But the alcohol, I just couldn't let go. I then met my wife. We had our first kid at a young age. I moved us out to our own apartment, and by that time, by the time I know it, I'm right back with the drugs and the drinking, which didn't make the relationship any easier. We were always arguing and always fighting. I got a DUI and I said I was going to stop, but shortly after I start drinking again and harder by this time. The alcohols and the drugs consumed my every thought to the point where I lost my wife. I lost my kids and my home. I was angry with myself that I couldn't stop being the way that I was. And why am I this way? My second DUI, I was possibly facing prison time because it was a lot, lot more serious. I finally said it, this time I'm done. I got my family back, my kids back, and my home, but I was still empty inside, and I couldn't understand why. I had a great job, my family was back in my hands, I was sober, but still empty and angry. That's when I heard of PTO. It was in this small group of men who didn't judge me and who were just as messed up as, I, as me that I was finally able to open up about everything in my past, and I finally realized I was the way I was because I haven't faced my past hurts. And I know it was the Lord and my brothers that walked me through this season of PTO, bringing me out a better man, a husband, a father. Finally, that emptiness is now full, and I live my life chasing God's ways and not my ways. And um, thank you, guys. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. All right, I'm going to give an honor to my wife real quick. And once again, I just... Prayer, prayer, prayer. God will answer those prayers. We have to stay faithful. And once again, I want to give honor to my wife because I told her to stop praying for me, that I didn't need prayer. I didn't need God. I could do this myself. That's not the case. She prayed for me nonstop. Here I am today in front of you guys. God is good. We're not just a church with groups, we are a church of groups. Because the right people help us change our lives. Life groups kick off in two weeks, sign up start today. And why do we place so much emphasis on that? Because we are truly better together. We need people to can help us to walk this out. The people that are in this church, none of us are perfect. Can I just be honest? I hate to put some people out there on blast, but none of us are perfect. But we're seeking together 
trying to be more like the perfect one. To walk with each other through whatever challenges you're facing. Because I promise you, if he could do it for me, he could do it for you. If he did it for my friend Joel, he can do it for you. And your family, and your situation, and your addiction, and your struggle. We're wired and created for community. God's not expecting you to be perfect. And this is when we begin to join together, begins to become more real and real that none of us got it all handled and we're still struggling with it. But God's not interested in your perfection, it's your progress. Some of you have been saying, I've been trying to work some steps in my life and I haven't seen the progress that I want. Don't worry about it. See, God's not judging you because you don't have it all together. God loves you with an everlasting love. A love without end. God doesn't just like you or doesn't just accept you, put up with you and just deal with you and say, well, I created them, so I guess I got to love them. No, God loves you and your inconsistency your failures your your struggles the, the the way that you can't seem to break through it you keep bringing this to God and you keep failing you keep starting and you keep stumbling you keep trying and you keep screwing it all up and God still loves you my brother God still loves you my sister your inability to get it right doesn't do anything more than increase the love of the Father for His children. It doesn't push you away. It allows Him to get closer because the moment that you can admit I am powerless without God is the moment that His love can come in and wreck you in the best way possible. It's the moment that He can hook you up and heal you and help you and transform you. The one that's begun a good work in you the one that has started the good work in you, the one if you allow today to start a new work in you, will not leave you until the task within you is finished. That's what Philippians 1, 6 says. His grace will be with you until the task is finished. This is why we can trust him. Because if you allow him to work on one thing. You let one domino tip in your life today. It will impact the rest of your life. Some of you, you just need to start with that one habit that God's been speaking to you about. Some of you, you just need to start with accepting his love for your life for the first time. But all of us in this room just need to take one step. This week, I've been challenged over and over of God, I can't do it without you. And the one word he's given me over these 21 days is, I will make a way. That's been my word for the things going on in my life. So as I surrender the one thing that the Holy Spirit is speaking to me today, I know I'm going to see victory. But I want you to see the same victory in your life. As you surrender to his will and his way. Can you bow your head with me today? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that we're here. That you've brought us here. That you see us in the midst of everything that we are not and you love us. Thank you that you are working on our behalf, that you are capable of doing the impossible. For those, God, that have been trying to live this life to the best of their abilities and keep coming up short, thank you that if we can surrender to you, you can take our best efforts and utterly take them up a notch. Because our best efforts will let us down, but surrendering to you will never let us down so thank you that you're here with every head still bowed every eye still closed if today 
the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you about just starting this one step as was shared earlier, this being your day one of surrendering to God and saying, God, I, I've tried to fix this on my own. I've tried to do it on my own and I can't. Then I'm gonna invite you to, in a moment, to lift up your hands so I know who I'm praying with and then pray with us. And I promise you, you invite the Holy Spirit into your life. You allow Jesus Christ to come in. He will take you and lead you into the life that he created you for. If that's you today on the count of three, I want you to lift up your hands so I know who I'm praying for. Ready? One, two, three. Who am I praying for? I see you. I see you in the back. I see you over here. I see you, family. Lower your hands. I want us together, because we don't do anything alone. New Life family, can we join together and pray for our brothers and sisters who are looking to make this change? And pray with me. Say, Father God, as best as I know how, I give you my life. Help me to become the person you created me to be. Transform my life. Help me stop the habits that have led me astray. Thank you for dying on the cross so that I can have life. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life and lead me into your kingdom. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Can we celebrate the change that God is doing in somebody's life?